I want to take you back to that spotlight investigation into the Catholic Church. And those who have seen the film will no doubt be familiar. But let's go back to that moment. How difficult an investigation was that? What were you facing? Well, we, we were facing uh, an extraordinarily powerful institution uh, to which all of us had paid too much deference for too long and they had no public reporting requirement. So it was a little bit like chipping away at a granite block with a small chisel. And, and active resistance, of course. Active you were having to yep. overcome sure. a real challenge. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but we, we worked hard at it. And uh, our first major discovery, you know, we were asked to look at the case of one priest. Mm. And we very quickly discovered that he was the tip of a very large iceberg, and we thought there were maybe, oh my God, 10 or 12 priests. And that was a huge story, and yet five months later, when we began to publish, uh, we were already aware that there were more than 100 priests and in it Boston. Became, and, and it spread beyond Boston, became an, exactly. a, a national story, and an international right, story. Right, and it happened at a time, and we didn't know this, it was so-called dawn of the internet age, mm. So that within um, a day or two, we were getting emails from victims of priests all over the world, including from here in Australia. Mm. You, do, you mentioned the dawn of the internet age and your investigation was dubbed the first investigative journalism of the internet age. How critical was it that it happened at that time when information could be shared so quickly all around the world? Well, I think if it had happened a year or two earlier, it would, have, would not have had nearly the impact that it had. And if you fast forward and think of if it happened today with social media, it would be even more viral much more quickly. So yes, it was a major factor back then. How much of a factor has that been more broadly, do you think, in shining a light into this? And I suppose also puncturing the cone of silence that had surrounded this particular issue of abuse in the Catholic Church? Well, it's clearly there now have been investigations in virtually every country in the developed world. And now we're seeing in, even in countries, I thought, in Latin America, where the state would never look at the sins of the church. Mm -hmm. We're beginning to see uh, activity there as well. And, and that's, that's a good thing. It's the Archbishop of Adelaide, Philip Wilson, who was convicted for being involved in the cover-up of this abuse. Yes. A senior figure, a senior clerical figure like that being convicted, what does that tell us then about the change in attitude uh, that we have seen after the investigative work that you did? There were, there were many, many bishops in the United States who I believe could have been prosecuted, even given our more narrower statute of limitations, mm -hmm. except prosecutors blinked. They were unwilling to take on the Catholic Church back then. I think now things have changed enough uh, that authorities would be willing to go after, after all the people who made this possible, who in effect facilitated and enabled the abusers to keep abusing children. I want to look more broadly at journalism and just going back to that earlier point that you'd made and I'd followed up and this question of the internet and the impact it had, certainly in making journalism easier in many respects and increasing the impact, but it's also eroded the business model, hasn't it? How much of an impact has that been on trying to do the type of work that you've been involved in? Yeah, well, you're right there. It's uh, been a double-edged sword, mm. obviously. And unfortunately, the sharper end of the sword has been its the impact of the internet on our financial model. Uh, most of the revenues we used to have, certainly in the newspaper business, uh, to do the kind of in-depth reporting that we should do, uh, have gone away, particularly the advertising revenue. And if you want to find out where it is, look at Google and Facebook. Mm. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I would submit that all good reporters are now investigative reporters because we have many more tools at our disposal. But, but is there less of a commitment from the institutions themselves because of the cost? Investigative re reporting done well is time intensive and it costs. 
That's true. Most news organizations now either do less of it or they, they, they do none of it. At the Boston Globe, uh, the Spotlight team, which was four, four of us when we did our investigation, is now 11. Mm. So we've actually increased our investigative assets. And the reason is, when you ask readers in, in surveys what do they value most from their newspaper, they almost always tell you it's investigative reporting mm. or reporting that holds powerful people and institutions accountable. So if that's what they want, it's not the baseball scores, it's that. How much more difficult is it now, and again, given the internet age, to be able to, uh, to I suppose, punch through a lot of the misinformation that is out there? And we're living in the era now of fake news and people are potential are just being bombarded with things right. and difficult to discern exactly what is truth and what is fiction. Yeah, it is true that nowadays, if a person wants to be able to make informed decisions, for instance, how to vote, he or she needs to be much more careful about accepting the information that they read from various sources. There's too much information out there that's not curated the way it so it, it means organisations like the Boston Globe or the New York Times or the Washington Post, I right. could go on and on, those mastheads, those brands become even more important, don't they? They do. They do. And uh, now you see, as perhaps we should have started this years ago, that when uh, news organisations like the Times or the Post or the Boston Globe do an investigative story, they give the reader much more information about how we did our reporting, mm. how many sources we have, why some of them are unnamed, what documents we have, so that people have a much better sense of exactly how reliable that report is. As someone, of course, who has uh, almost coined the phrase fake news, certainly uses it a lot, is Donald Trump. Has Donald Trump's ascension to the White House also had another impact, and that is that we have seen journalism front and centre? It's been good for business, hasn't it? It's been good for business, and I would argue uh, that he's the new patron saint of our First Amendment, mm. that uh, here's someone who would like to get rid of all the watchdogs, but because of him, the watchdogs are all barking, and they're all barking all the time. Uh, so all of a sudden, uh, Washington, D.C., where not much investigative reporting really was done in the past, is a hotbed of uh, investigative reporting by major news organizations. Yeah, can, can I, I look a bit more broadly at the challenges that journalism faces globally? We're seeing in the information age, as you've pointed out, information spread more widely, the, the downside of that with the rise of fake news. But how much more difficult is it for journalists to ply their trade given the rise of authoritarian regimes, the number of journalists who were locked up, and even in democratic nations with this idea of the freedom of the media, a curbing of some of the freedoms because of the impact of the war on terrorism, for instance, and greater security and surveillance legislation? Yeah. It is more difficult nowadays for journalists. And far and away much more dangerous personally to journalists operating in many parts of the world. Uh, there's no question about that. It is troubling to all of us to see uh, countries like Hungary that started out democratic uh, shutting down the free press and becoming more oppressive. Uh, one thing, frankly, that surprised me and, and saddened me uh, here in Australia is the government restrictions on the press reporting on certain criminal cases. Mm. So that in a country which I thought was as free as our own, and in the United States, every trial is public because we believe, and we believe we're right, that we could pick an impartial juror, jury even mm. when there is massive publicity. But here we have uh, in Australia uh, cases of momentous importance where the judiciary decides the public doesn't have a right to know. And that's very, very troubling, I think. Just finally, we've seen um, a, a decreasing faith in institutions. We've talked about the church, we've talked about government and, and political leaders. How much does that apply to journalism as well? How much faith has been lost in journalism? What do you see the role of journalism 
being in the world today and restoring some of that lost faith? Yeah, I think uh, I, don't, uh, I don't worry as much about the polling that shows the press being unpopular. I mean, if we're doing our job, we're going to mm. make people angry. There's a difference, isn't there, between being unpopular, though, and people just not believing it anymore or not having faith in journalism and journalists as if it has become uh, too fractured, fragmented, not speaking to me, right. a loss of relevance, all of those questions. Right. Well, there's a, there's a parallel to the US Congress. Uh, everybody hates the Congress, but people tend to like their own mm. member of Congress. <laughs> and I think in the press, if you look more closely at the polling that shows how unpopular the press is, and you break it down, people actually do trust their local mm -hmm. broadcaster, certainly public broadcasting, both here and in the U.S. Uh, but what, we're all lumped in together in the U.S. with Fox News, MSNBC, uh, many of which get people very angry. So they may be unpopular to an extreme, and we all get lumped in together, but, but I think... Uh, people trust particularly local mm. newspapers and broadcasters to get it right. 